Uh, <clears throat> since uh, IFPRI has been distributing its literature on fertilizer subsidy, I thought I should recommend another publication to you. Uh, it's a USAID publication evaluating fertilizer subsidies in developing countries by Dana Dalrymple. I think Dana is actually over there. Uh, he sent it to me when he saw that I was on the program here. The interesting thing is this publication is from 1975. Uh, and when you read it, you say, wow, that's uh, very relevant today. I think we're, what we're really doing is revisiting many of the same issues that we've been struggling with uh, over many years. In fact, when I read his conclusions, uh, I was very sympathetic to where we stand today. Uh, when I started looking at fertilizer subsidies, yes, there's really a strong case and we have to get fertilizer moving in Africa. Uh, there really is a, uh, a good case for subsidization, even from an economic, straight economics point of view, there's a case that's been made. Uh, but it's really difficult in practice. And what you finish up saying, well, yes, there's a place for subsidies, but be very careful because they can really uh, get out of hand. I came at this, uh, uh, I guess, about 2005. I was involved in the uh, lead-up meetings to the Africa Fertilizer Sum Summit. And, of course, that was one of the big issues that we had to struggle with, uh, is, is how to deal with the demand side and, and, and fertilizer subsidies. In the end, I think the summit, I'd have to go back and check the actual uh, pronouncement, but the, 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 the summit did come out with a, an endorsement of fertilizer subsidies, but, in, but particularly talked about uh, market smart subsidies. We then went on uh, after that, and I was involved in the World Development Review, uh, and when we were discussing, uh, and Karen was involved in some of those discussions as well, uh, with our various stakeholders in Africa, that was the first question that was always put on the table. What is the World Development Report going to say about fertilizer subsidies in Africa? Uh, so we, we, we actually then uh, went uh, and actually endorsed what we call market smart subsidies. Um, and market smart subsidies, in, in that context, we had three critical dimensions. Uh, one is the subsidies that help build markets and help build private markets. And, and the sorts of voucher programs that have been described to you are very much part of that. And hand the vouchers, give it to the people, uh, and then that helps to, to build the markets, to provide the volume, to be able to uh, get economies of scale and bring down uh, the, price of, the price of fertilizer. So that was the first dimension. Uh, the second, second dimension uh, is that they should be well targeted targeted in ways that you're reaching uh, people who are not using fertilizer or certainly not using very much of it. Uh, so you're not displacing existing commercial sales. So that was another critical dimension of what we were calling market, uh, market smart subsidy. And finally, and perhaps the most difficult one, building an exit strategy. So if you're going to make this sustainable, you have to have a way to get out of it because by, by definition, if you subsidize something at a fixed rate and it's successful, the volume grows, your budget, your budget uh, demands grow as well. So having some way to be able to control that uh, drain on the budget uh, was critical because that's what really led to the failure of uh, many of the fertilizer subsidy programs in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, let me just make a, a couple of comments. Um, I, think, I think the case for, uh, for increasing fertilizer in Africa, that's already been made. I think the case, uh, Nick has made the case strongly, and there is a, there is a justification uh, for subsidizing inputs in the early stages of, uh, of development, early stages of adoption uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. The problem come, I think, largely in the difficulty. It's easier said than done. And I think what we're seeing is the implementation. Uh, we, we, we're, I think we're, we're still a long way from what we call our smart, market smart subsidies. And I think sometimes we're also getting into, back into the dumb subsidy uh, syndrome. Um, and so what you've seen in, in, in cases like Malawi, uh, got a lot of press 
but it's state directed and, and the subsidies and the input distribution is still going through the state. So you're not developing a market. Uh, so there's some really sufficient difficult uh, issues there to be resolved in terms of a sustainable development of an input system, uh, in the input market system in Malawi. Uh, they're not well targeted in many cases, and this is something I'm not sure we've seen any good examples of, of well targeted uh, in input subsidy, even using uh, vouchers. I think uh, some of the work that IFDC done on the input for assets where vouchers are distributed as part of a food for work program uh, they're probably the best targeted because they're really soft targeting. Um, they're expensive, uh, and this is where you really run into problems. Uh, when you're getting up in several countries now, 75% of your, of your expenditures on agriculture going into fertilizer subsidies, but yet your research station is falling down. Uh, I think that's, that, that you're, you're getting a short run, bang, but in the long run, you're going to pay for it. So keeping this in balance, I think, is really critical. And finally, political capture. Uh, this is always a problem with subsidies, and, and, uh, but with vouchers, it's an even bigger problem because if you're out there before the election and the Ministry of Agriculture Extension Agents distributing vouchers, uh, that's, that's, that's great propaganda. Uh, now, it doesn't always work. Uh, Ghana introduced their input subsidy program uh, right before the last election. They introduced it late, uh, but they didn't win the election. But, but certainly, uh, certainly the, the, the political capture uh, of subsidies is really something we have to uh, grapple with, and I think it's something we underestimated uh, when we were endorsing the idea of, of, of market uh, smart subsidies. Let, let me go on, and then the final point is uh, that I think hasn't been emphasized enough here uh, is there are many people, and I, I will, some people I should say, who are very strong advocates of, uh, of the Malawi program and other programs on fertilizer subsidies. Uh, as they're seeing it as a magic bullet. Uh, finally, we found a way to solve and bring the Green Revolution to Africa just by subsidizing fertilizer. And I think that's uh, I think that's a, 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 a false promise. Uh, I, don't, I think there's a lot more. You have to embed a, a subsidy program like this in a much wider uh, agricultural uh, strategy. And let me just give you a couple of examples of where uh, this can happen. I, I think Kenya is a good example, uh, other than the small program that Nick mentioned, uh, that has made really good progress on developing a private sector input distribution system for fertilizer. And so Kenya now has the highest level of fertilizer use in sub-Saharan Africa, outside of South Africa. It's smallholder, a lot of it's on food crops, not just cash crops, and it's been going up over time, and partly because the marketing margin uh, between the CIF price and the wholesale price in the inland has been steadily declining uh, through improvements in policy, improvements in logistics, uh, training of input dealers and so on, uh, so that the input dealers now, I think the average Kenyan farmer now only has to go three kilometers to get to an input dealer. So the real progress in developing a, uh, a, a very dense network of, of private sector dealers uh, in Kenya. And so you need to have this sort of activity uh, and intervention going alongside uh, subsidies so you do really develop uh, a sustainable market. Another, another um, illustration from Kenya I think is, is, is interesting also in this very recent work, uh, just looking at the returns to fertilizer in, a, in western Kenya and they've been able to plot that against soil carbon content for thousands of fields. Uh, and there's a whole lot of uh, fields uh, down on the left-hand side of that graph where you get very low response to fertilizer because they're so degraded, they've been farmed so continuously over time that the actual response is quite low. So whether you subsidize or not, you're getting a, a, a poor response. So you need a much more balanced approach in that sort of situation, including building up of your organic matter, soil rotations, legumes, and so on, 
if you're going to solve the soil fertility problem in a situation like that. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, back to Malawi again, uh, you know, has, has Malawi, yes, they've increased maize production, uh, made significant progress, it's been costly, uh, but they haven't solved the basic problem of food insecurity and hunger. Uh, and you see what's happened to prices back in February this year, uh, prices of maize, the de staple food crop in Malawi, went over $500 per ton. Now that wasn't because of the global food price spike, it was because of what was happening in Malawi, the management of their uh, food reserves and their uh, food marketing system, and highly volatile. And I would guess, and I haven't seen the next time we see really good figures on, on uh, hunger and malnutrition in Malawi, I would guess that we haven't had made nearly as much progress as we, we thought we had, simply because we haven't really been able to stabilize and, and provide food at an affordable price to farmers. And remember that most small-scale farmers in sub-Saharan Africa now are food deficit. So when you have those sorts of price spikes, it's even the, in rural areas, it's small-scale farmers that are suffering. So the bottom line uh, for me uh, is in, in looking at where we are now and this very brief review um, is that yes, uh, we can make rapid gains. Uh, some of these voucher programs I think show a lot of pro progress. And I added there, if it rains, we haven't had a situation in Malawi yet where it hasn't rained, uh, but we still have a long way to go in terms of, of more effective, cost-effective uh, and efficient implementation. So learning and adjustment, I think uh, getting some interchange among these various programs that are uh, in the field at, uh, at the moment is very important. Uh, and finally, put all our subsidies. We've solved the problem. Uh, we, must, we must remember this is just one component of, of a lot of other things that we need to get uh, successful and sustainable uh, food production in Africa. Thanks very much.